Fed's trying to create the illusion of tightening, but they're not. They're not tightening at all. Um, when the interest rates, nominal interest rates, are still below the rate of inflation, that's not a tightening cycle. If we go back to the last big inflation cycle in the late 1970s, when Paul Volcker was running the Federal Reserve, he raised interest rates on a nominal basis well in excess of inflation. We saw interest rates approach 20% when inflation was raging at about 14 to 15%. So he clearly was serious about taming inflation. If the Federal Reserve actually tightened interest rates above the rate of inflation, they would bankrupt the US government. I think the Fed will find some pretense to pivot next year. And I think the central banks globally will, will just follow suit. And they'll inflate their way out of the debt that they've strapped on since the credit crisis 15 years ago. There's no other conceivable way for them to deal with that debt. They want inflation, make no mistake about it. And that's when gold is going to gallop to highs that we've never seen before. Welcome to another RTD interview. Today, I'm excited to have returning guest, Mr. David Garofalo. He is the CEO and president of Gold Royalty Corp. And today, Dave joins us to share his thoughts on the economy, as well as current events in the gold royalty space. So, David, welcome back to RTD interviews. Thank you for having me on. Well, I appreciate you taking time to sit down with us again. Definitely looking forward to getting caught up on what's happening with Gold Royalty Corp. And before we do that, uh, as, we, as I mentioned beforehand, audience has grown a little bit. So definitely want to uh, get a chance to get your thoughts on the current investing macro uh, environment we're in now. But before we do that, can you give us a brief background as to you know who you are and how you arrived at this point in your career, if you don't mind? Sure. I've been in the mining business for 32 years principally in operating and mine development roles. I ran Gold Corp uh, until I merged it with Newmont to create the world's biggest gold company back in 2019. Uh, before that, I spent uh, six years running Hud Bay Minerals on the copper side, 12 years with Igneco Eagle as CFO, Igneco being the third largest gold producer in the world. And before that, eight years with Inmet. So principally in operating and mine development roles. And now I've switched over to running a royalty vehicle, which we IPO'd back in March of 2021 on the NYC American G-R-O-Y, G Roy on the NYC. Sounds good. Well, thank you for sharing that. And so uh, curious to get your thoughts. Uh, we last connected earlier this year. And of course, since then, lots of things, uh, lots of things have changed. And uh, we're approaching the end of 2022. Uh, just curious to get your thoughts on current environment we're in. You know, what are some things that either con you know, concerns you or, or excites you on the other end of that? Well, what excites me from a gold perspective is we're still in a period of declining real interest rates. So we are seeing the Federal Reserve and other central banks raise the nominal rate uh, of uh, the cost of borrowing. But the reality is inflation has continued to accelerate. And so interest rates on a real basis are continuing to decline deeper and deeper into negative territory. That's very constructive for gold. Historically, in interest rate cycles like we're experiencing right now, where real interest rates are going down, gold goes up 350 to 400%. And that's based on past historical cycles. We're only up about 80% in the current declining interest rate cycle. So we're still underperforming what we've done in last cycles by at least a factor of 25%. So we still have a significant upsize in the gold price. We're, we're forecasting gold of $3,000 an ounce, which would actually be the real all-time high adjusted to today's dollars. If you look at the gold price we experienced back in the last inflationary cycle of over $800 an ounce in the late 70s and early 80s, Inflation just that to 2022, we expect to see $3,000 an ounce gold. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, very interesting there. Now, you hinted at inf the inflation side of things. And so, of course, CPI figures, uh, you know, appear to have peaked in sometime early summer, and yet it looked to be trending downward, depending on where you're uh, geographically located at. Do you see a, uh, a reversal in trend to where we'll actually see continuation of increased uh, CPI figures, or are we literally trending down due to the tightening side of things, or will the Fed be able to actually fight this inflation or as they are trying to paint the picture? <laughs> Fed's trying to create the illusion of tightening, but they're not. They're not tightening at all. Um, when the interest rates, nominal interest rates are still below the rate of inflation, that's not a tightening cycle. If we go back to the last big inflation cycle in the late 1970s, when Paul Volcker was running the Federal Reserve, he raised interest rates on a nominal basis well in excess of inflation. We saw interest rates approach 20% when inflation was raging at about 14 to 15%. So he clearly was serious about taming inflation. The Federal Reserve can't do that this time. Back in the late 1970s, the debt to GDP globally was only 100%. Today, it's 325%. If the Federal Reserve actually tightened interest rates above the rate of inflation, they would bankrupt 
the U.S. government. They would bankrupt emerging economies. There's so much debt strapped on now. There is no fiscally responsible way for the, for the governments to repay it. And there's no responsible way for the Federal Reserve to raise rates without dramatically increasing service costs on that debt. In fact, since the onset of this tightening cycle, uh, debt service costs in the U.S. have ballooned from half a, half a trillion dollars a year to a trillion dollars a year. One out of every seven dollars raised by the US federal government is going to debt service today. And that's with a very modest tightening of interest rates since the onset of this cycle. So if they went up two, 300, 400 basis points, the federal government would be unsustainable. There wouldn't be a way to fiscally, in, in a responsible way, fiscally uh, service the debt. It would bankrupt the US government. All right, now what's the probability of this current environment can, being able to continue on a little longer due to the fact it's a global tightening from other banks? And of course, we're with Sydney seeing the Dixie at all, not all time highs, but extremely high levels now, which ultimately impacts other nations. And so is there a possibility that this can be a prolonged experience and they're able to probably maneuver some things that we could never have imagined? Well, I think what the Federal Reserve ultimately will do is pivot next year. Uh, they will say, you know, uh, employment markets are softening. Uh, the headline CPI number is going lower. Don't fool yourself. Real inflation is not eight or nine percent; it's fifteen to twenty percent. You know, look at what we eat and, and fuel with and shelter with on a daily basis. Mortgage service costs have gone up eighty percent since the onset of this inflation cycle. Your monthly mortgage payments, if you have variable rate mortgages. That's not captured in the CPI number, but it's a cost of living. Right. And so I think the Fed will find some pretense to pivot next year. And I think the central banks globally will, will just follow suit. And they'll inflate their way out of the debt that they've strapped on since the credit crisis 15 years ago. There's no other conceivable way for them to deal with that debt. They want inflation, make no mistake about it. And that's when gold is going to gallop to highs that we've never seen before. All right. And in the meantime, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, could the possibility of this energy situation in Europe that will eventually make its way here in oil prices, assuming that, would that be also a reason why they might be forced to pivot or perhaps, or or what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it'll cause a, a horrible recession and the Federal Reserve, again, will have to find a way to uh, loosen monetary policy, uh, stim re-stimulate the economy to deal with uh, stagflation, uh, so high unemployment, uh, recession, uh, inflation as well, and they're going to have to inflate their way out of debt. So we're going to see a pivot from the Federal Reserve. It's inevitable. Our call is for some time in the middle of next year. Mm, interesting. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Of course, you know, you, you got you, you specialize in the gold space. And so uh, we've had a lot of developments in gold in particular since we last connected. And one of them happens to be with Russia's uh, announcement of that quasi gold peg of, you know, I think it was 5,000 rubles to one gram, quite shocking to say the least, as well as other nations starting to accumulate more. So apparently there's some type of uh, something developing with gold. How has that impacted your forecast, if at all, or is that completely separate from what you guys are projecting? No, it really goes into the stew, if you will, in that we've seen uh, a prolonged period of central banks, particularly in emerging economies like China and Russia and beyond, accumulate gold because they're dealing with an avalanche of foreign currency proceeds because they're export markets, right? In China, it's manufacturing. In Russia, it's energy. So historically, they've had to deal with an influx of U.S. dollars into the central bank reserves, and they've been diversifying as rapidly as they can into hard assets like gold in their central bank reserves. In fact, China is the largest producer of gold in the world as a country. It's also the largest consumer of gold. So they not only consume all of the gold they produce, but they're the biggest importer of gold as well. So they're hoovering up all the gold they can find so they can diversify. And that's certainly been the case in Russia. That's what's allowed them to restabilize the ruble is the fact that they have that physical backing in their central bank reserves in gold. Hmm. Now, with the energy situation, as well as all the events out east, is there more pressures on the mining space in particular because of energy costs or things like that? And how has that impacted? And if we do hit that recession, as you mentioned, typically mining shares, you know, usually as you know, don't do well in that environment. But could this be different in a sense? Well, that, that's a, that's the challenge. Uh, we do believe gold is going to gallop upwards. It's going to be violent upwards move in the gold price when the Federal Reserve starts to pivot and people realize, you know, what interest rates are going to continue to go down both on a nominal and real basis. And they'll look to protect their assets, safeguard their savings, and they'll buy gold to do that. That's historically been the case. And as I said, we see gold, uh, you know, going up another, at least another 300% from where we are right now, based on historical norms. 
So I think that um, uh, you know you're going to see uh, uh, inflation in fact not only the supply chain of the economy generally, but also mining companies. And so if you believe in gold as an asset class, the best place to be in my view is either in physical gold or in royalty companies because the mining operators are going to see their margins squeezed by inflation and labor costs, energy costs and the like that ultimately the entire economy is going to experience. And historically, when you've looked at how operators have, produ- have, have um, performed relative to the commodity, they've tended to underperform in those inflationary cycles. And so the best example I can give you is coming out of the credit crisis a dozen years ago when gold went up 140%. Um, and we saw the producers only go up about 65% because they had significant inflation in their supply chain as everybody was building new mines in the midst of the Chinese super cycle. And I, I and what we saw is the royalty companies actually outperformed dramatically. They were up about 350%, again, against the commodity going up 140 and the producers going up 66%. So everybody went up in a bull environment. Every bolt floated up as the incoming tide came in. But the relative outperformers were in the royalty and streaming space because they provide that top line exposure, a percentage of the revenue, but completely insulate their shareholders from cost inflation because we don't get a percentage of the profits, we get a percentage of the top line of the revenue. Mm, interesting. Now, just before we move into Gold World Decor, I'm curious to see your thoughts because I, I've yet to uh, really ask any people I've interviewed this question. Uh, as far as actual costs of mining right now in relation to you know the actual ounce off the ground, how much is, roughly speaking, are most average or are most mining companies you know, profitable right now with current prices? Yeah, the, the biggest producers are um, the marginal producers, the ones at the margins of the industry. Uh, they're actually shutting down operations. Uh, some of them are actually going into CCW or chapter of the equivalent of chapter 11. So they're experiencing massive cost inflation. And we've seen a number of these producers having to suspend operations. And that's going to be a recurring theme as the costs go up and the gold price has yet not responded to that inflation threat that we've seen up to this point, but ultimately will. And so I would say the marginal producers are struggling. Uh, the big guys that have the economies of scale are still making reasonable profits, but they've been squeezed. There's been a steady parade of mining companies, even at the senior ranks, having to readjust cost expectations in the market. We saw that in the last quarterly results. Mm-hmm. Uh, Newmont, for example, saw a 50% decline in their share prices. They announced yet a third uh, readjustment of their cost expectations just in this current year. Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody's trying to play catch up in terms of what the inflation is doing to their cost structures. All right. Interesting. So let's dive into uh, Gold Royalty Corp. So uh, I think we last connected in February, as I mentioned. Of course, you guys had some some recent developments since then. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on what's going on there. And also for those who might be new, perhaps uh, give us a quick glimpse, because based upon all the conditions you described, royalty space seems to be uh, you know, I'm not necessarily immune, but outside of the possible market downtrend if that happens. So share with us a little brief and from explanation as to the whole royalty space so people can get an idea of what's going on. Yeah, well, there's probably about 15 to 20 players in the royalty space, the biggest being Franco Nevada, Wheat and Precious Metals and Royal Gold. And those are the large cap uh, players or blue chip companies that generate significant cash flow from a well diversified portfolio of companies and they pay a reasonable dividend. And so they tend to get the best multiple in the space, typically two to three times the net asset value of their business. Mm -hmm. So very, very richly and, and deservedly uh, priced in the market. And then there's the rest of us that are relatively smaller cap. But we stand out relative to our peers in that we have now over 200 royalties in our portfolio. That's right up there with the seniors. Mm -hmm. We have eight that are producing, uh, 12 in the construction and development stage. And so we have the highest growth rate in royalty revenue in the entire sector, even bigger than the senior players at about 60% compounded annual growth in revenue over the next five to 10 years from a collection of assets entirely within the Americas with a heavy uh, preponderance of those royalties in the three best jurisdictions in the world uh, for mining, Nevada, Quebec, and Ontario and Canada. And so we have about 80% of the value of our business focused on those jurisdictions in a very diversified and growing portfolio of royalties. And so we have growth in revenue, we have a dividend. Now uh, we pay over a 1% yield uh, on our stock and we introduce that dividend 10 months after our IPO because of the significant growth we have in our revenue, we have a cost structure that's insignificant. Mm -hmm. I have seven full-time employees equivalent, and I could run a business 10 times the size with the same number of employees. So as our revenue grows, 
and that 60% growth is crystallized, that goes right to the bottom line. That gives me a high degree of confidence that I'll be able to grow that dividend over time because of that increase in free cash flow over the next five to 10 years. And the beautiful thing about our portfolio of over 200 royalties is they're completely bought and paid for. We never have to put another dime into them. And we just have to wait for those, those, uh, those operations to grow, uh, to complete construction and to deliver revenue to our bottom line and ultimately to our shareholders in the form of dividends. And the other important element of our portfolio is our operating partners are conducting 700,000 meters of diamond drilling, of exploration drilling on those properties. That's the equivalent of a $200 million exploration budget being spent on those properties. You know how much we contribute? Zero. We don't have to. We own the royalties outright. We bought and paid for them. So we get all of that exploration upside without having to pay a dime for it. Interesting. Now, you mentioned on the dividend side of things. So is it common uh, for a company of your size to be able to pay that type of dividend so, so soon of a time after you mentioned after going public? Extremely rare in our sector uh, for a company of our size, you know, multi hundred million dollar market cap company. Um, and that speaks to the quality of the assets. Um, it's not just about the quantity of our royalties. We have 200 plus royalties. But we have a royalty in Canada's biggest gold mine. We have a royalty in Canada's second biggest gold mine. And we have a royalty on the US's biggest gold mine. These are operating mines that we have and about to come into operation mines that we have royalties on. These are multi-decade reserves. So we have a foundational element to our story that provides an annuity for our shareholders for decades to come long after I'm gone. These, these assets will be spinning out cash flow and dividends for our shareholders. Interesting. Now, if you don't mind, share with us some of the uh, key, I guess, you know, investors that people perhaps might know of that just shows how serious of a company and how serious it is for what you guys are, you know, what assets you guys do hold. Certainly. I mean, uh, recently we just bought a package of royalties from Nevada Gold Mines, which is owned by Barrick and Newmont. So Barrick and Newmont now have become two of our biggest shareholders uh, as a result. And that obviously speaks to the quality of our portfolio um, and the quality of what they bended into us. Um, most recently, the Granite Creek project in Nevada, which will be uh, producing uh, royalties for us within a couple of years. Um, and uh, beyond that, we have Jimmy Lee, who is a biggest shareholder of Golden Valley Company we took over last year. He's a uh, 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 a magnet in the pulp and paper business out of Dubai. Uh, Rob McEwen was the biggest shareholder of Abitibi Royalties. We took over th them last year. He became a large shareholder. Eric Sprott was the biggest shareholder of Ely Gold, a company we took over last year. And as a result, rolled his shares into those of, of, um, uh, of gold, uh, gold royalty as well. And so uh, we've, we've assembled a very, very strong roster of shareholders. In addition to that, uh, we have Ian Telfer, who founded Wheat and Precious Metals 15 years ago. He's the chair of our advisory board and was a cornerstone investor in our IPO as well. So very, very impressive roster of people. Among our management and board, we have 400 years of mining industry experience and not just royalty experience. I'm talking about mine building and operations experience, which gives us a unique value proposition because we understand the risks of what we're investing in because we've been in their shoes. Uh, but we also have access to virtually anybody in the mining industry. And that's why we've been able to grow so quickly. We've been able to accumulate these assets in bilateral negotiations rather than competitive processes where you tend to overpay. All right, sounds good. Well, David, I, I appreciate you for giving us an update uh, as to what's going on. And definitely, uh, hopefully, the, the definitely audience is able to realize the opportunity in this uh, you know, presentation here. So I thank you for joining us. Uh, for those who, who perhaps might be new to this, can you point them back to where you guys are, public, are listed at and things of that nature, how to find out more if they're interested? We're, our website is goldroyalty.com. So please sign up for our, our newsletter. Uh, call our 1-800 number. I quite often return calls to shareholders. Love to hear from you. Uh, but we're listed on the NYSE American under the trading symbol G-Roy, G-R-O-Y. Sounds good. Once again, David, thank you for joining us RT Interviews. Definitely looking forward to staying in tune with the project there and having you on in the future and see where we're at at that point. But once again, thank you for joining us on RT Interviews. Thank you for having me on.